So after today, our tutorials are over, which I think you'll be happy about. Okay, so one, before, I, before I start, one thing, uh, sorry with the, with the mashup with the videos on the YouTube. Um, I'll upload the new one. Um, today, just for your knowledge, when we have lectures in this hall, the video is automatically recorded by the multimedia services. So you can go to the video portal. So even if it's not on YouTube, you can always go on the video portal. Check, um, just look at the lectures this semester, uh, physics developments, and choose this course, and you'll see the the automated recording. So even if it's not on YouTube yet, because for that I need to download it from there and then upload it, and sometimes there can be mishaps like me clicking on the wrong button. Um, okay, so the the topic of our final tutorial are clocks. And yeah, Ralph already told you a lot about them in the lecture. And we're going to focus on three topics. So first, we're going to quickly recap again the ideal peak clock and how we can use it to implement the unitaries on the system. Then we'll scan through the, I think maybe this one about the limits of the quasi-ideal clock and what happens if we take the um, the frequency to the infinity and so on, and what happens if we take dimension to the infinity. Uh, and finally, we will look at something uh, new, which we haven't covered in the lecture, which is the thermodynamic limit of clocks. And there we understand the clock a bit differently than in these two cases, because first we'll look at the clock as an uh, as a device which would allow us to run our unitaries on the system. And when we'll be talking about the the clock as in here, we'll be just talking about the device which can regularly produce ticks, like as our usual I don't know, clock that's that is on our arms or yeah or in our phones. Okay. So let's start with the ideal peak clock. And as we see in the lecture, we can model an idealized clock by the following, by taking uh, the time operator as the coordinate of the clock and the Hamiltonian then as just the momentum of the clock. And basically, it has three properties that we have to keep in mind. So first, uh, and why we think it's it can be a good thing to think about when we think about clocks is first it has a distinguishable basis of time states or whatever we call time states here. So in this case, we're thinking about time as in terms of the position of the clock. So, so this clock has this this basis, and this basis is indeed distinguishable because it's orthogonal in this continuous sense. <coughs> Sorry. Um, okay, and also the time translations for for this clock they correspond to the space translations. So basically, if we take the initial state of the clock, um, yeah, x, and then we evolve it with our Hamiltonian for the time t, then basically because, because our Hamiltonian is a, is a momentum operator, then this is a shift operator, and it will shift our position by t. Okay, um, and then in that sense, the natural evolution of this clock passes through all x primes, which are on the right side of x, which is also natural when we think about time. Yes. So it's using a constant, okay? Ah, okay. So basically, when I say that t operator is x. As you may, may already have um, heard, like it's very hard for 
uh, for quantum mechanics to uh, to define what t what the, what is a time operator that is one of the problems so when i say like that t operator is x i say that yeah we kind of take we think about the time of the clock as its x coordinate but here the time t is just the number for it's just the usual t for which we um evolve the system um so yeah, so this is just just uh, my metaphorical way of saying that, oh, this we think about time for this clock as its position. Okay, so then second, uh, it's it has this cont continuity property, uh, which is that. So if I take a state. Um, and evolve it with our Hamiltonian for time t, and I want to take the uh, x representation of the state. It is the same as just shifting the state, because I can act with this operator here, and this then I get this. And so this property is called continuity. So when we evolve the state, we effectively shift it. Um, and third one is the one that we're going to talk about is that it allows for uh, continuous um, autonomous control on an external system. Which, in this sense, in this case, means that we can just write uh, run unitaries using uh, timing it by by this clock. Okay. Um, so. So basically, uh, if we if we add um, if we add a position dependent potential to the clock. It remains uh, continuous, and the state is modified by a phase. So this you've seen in lecture. So what, it mean, what I mean by this is the following. So say that we take the same Hamiltonian, but we add a phase, and then we, sorry, not the phase, but the potential, um, which will add a phase. And we look at it in the position. So basically, this will give me a phase x minus t to x v of x prime dx prime x minus t psi. OK. Uh, and then, and then, coming from that, we can actually write the solution uh, to the Schrodinger equation given this potential as the following. So, psi of x t will be psi of x minus t zero, and this phase. Okay, um, so you can take this solution and plug it into the Schrodinger equation, and you can verify that it is indeed the solution to the Schrodinger equation with this Hamiltonian. Um, yeah, so. This is fairly easy to do, especially if you remember the Leibniz formula. So Leibniz integral rule. So this is how uh, to take the uh, the derivative of of an integral with a chain which over the limits of the integral.
Okay. Uh, does everybody, is everybody familiar with the Leibniz rule? At least like you have a vague memory of it. Okay, I can also write it down here, if you prefer. Yes, okay. So the Leibniz rule, we're taking the derivative of the following integral. Okay, so here the problem is that not only the integrated function depends on t, but also the limits of the integral depend on t. Then this can be written as the following. Looks a bit like the um, integrating by parts thing. Okay, d of t minus f of a of t T D D T A of T All right, yes, plus integral D D T of X T DX. Yeah, and using this rule, we can just easily take the time derivative and you'll basically be done. Okay, so this was just adding the, the potential to the, to the Hamiltonian of the clock itself. But now, so suppose that we have an external system, let's call it S, and in some state, rho S, the Hilbert space HS, and we want to implement a unitary US um, in a time interval from uh, TI to TF. And this unitary is energy preserving, so what we assume is that U commutes with HS. Yeah, US commutes with HS. Okay, so first is how do we represent this process um, of implementing something from TI and TF, from TI to TF? Uh, we write the unitary as the uh, implementing some Hamiltonian. So in this form, which we here for now call uh, interaction. And then what we can do to implement it exactly between the times Ti and Tf, we can write the total Hamiltonian as like the, the initial Hamiltonian of the system plus the interaction Hamiltonian multiplied by V of T where V of T is just a function uh, which between, an integral of which between Ti and Tf gives us one. And this is also called a normalized pulse. Okay, um, then if we take this Hamiltonian and we apply it to the system S, uh, what do we get? So, um, as our unitary is energy preserving from the fact that US commutes with HS, it follows that um, the interaction Hamiltonian and the initial Hamiltonian of the system, they also commute. Um, and 
yeah, just 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 a comment. Like we are now calling this interaction Hamiltonian because, in the um, yeah in the in the next round we'll couple this interaction Hamiltonian to the potential on the clock. But for now we're just looking at the system S alone. Uh, then we can write this uh, the state of the system S at time t just by writing its evolution. Okay, so which we can separate into two evolutions, just the usual one um, of this of the system and the evolution driven by the interaction Hamiltonian because they commute. Row, same thing here. Okay. Um, yes, and ah, I completely forgot about the v of t. So when I, in fact, when I will write it in terms of the exponential, I'll get an integral here. So, so I'm going to be i t. It's going to be integral uh, from t i to t final v of t. T i to t final v of t prime dt prime rho s and on this side the same thing. But it's anyway one, so that's here you see why we choose one. For, for the normalization of poles. Okay. Um, then the next step that we do, we say that because these two Hamiltonians commute, they have a basis in which they are both diagonal. So we just write both of them in that basis. So let's say we label this basis as some phi j's. Over J, um, how should I label it? Yeah, let's say omega J, YJ, YJ. Okay, um, and again, you can just substitute these into the uh, into this evolution, and basically, what you will get is if you apply just the usual. So first, for example, you apply the um, just the usual evolution given by HS. Um, and in that case, if we write rho S as a rho of MN by M by N, so in the same basis that these two are written in, then uh, from evolving under this, each state will just gain, um, each basis state will just gain a corresponding phase given by e to the power e n minus uh, e m. Uh, so basically, this is if, when we apply just h s. And I'll just incorporate this phase into the a row of mn, say it's row of mn t. Uh, and then we apply the interaction Hamiltonian, and the interaction Hamiltonian uh, 
will act in the same way, but give us the phase which would be given by um, these omega j's. So basically what we arrive to after the interaction Hamiltonian is yeah, rho is prime, let's say, sum over m n rho m n of t e to the power minus omega m minus omega n um, so integral v um, phi m phi n okay so uh, in a case when we choose this v as a normalized pulse this integral is uh, is basically one and this is what we get after the evolution after implementing this unitary yes uh, we didn't I mean I because they commute because I I chose the unitary to, pre to perform a unitary which preserves the energy of the system, it meant that uh, they commute with the Hamiltonian. It meant that the Hamiltonian describing the unitary evolution would also commute with the HS, and then I can just choose the basis in which they're both diagonal. And then I just write the, um, yeah, I also wrote the state of the system in the same basis. Okay. Uh, so this was just the system. And now the final trick is to take our clock and incorporate that clock into, uh, into running the unitary. And the way we do it is we write a joint Hamiltonian of the system and the clock. So before I was just thinking about the, this pulse potential V of T as just some numerical function I multiply my interaction Hamiltonian with and now I'm, I'll be thinking about it as just as a actual potential on the clock. And basically then I can write H total on the clock and the system as our individual Hamiltonians on the system and the clock. So the clock has the P Hamiltonian. And then I also add our interaction Hamiltonian. Uh, coupled with the potential V, but because, um, because the time in our clock is described by position, the V will rely on the, will be dependent on the position on the clock. Okay. Uh, so, and one assumption that we make is that the initial state of the Hamiltonian and the clock is, uh, uh, is, a, is a separable state with the regards to, is a tensor product state with regards to the system and the clock. So C would be rho S tensor product sum state phi, let's say, on the clock. Okay, um, and then basically, um, yeah, the derivation is very similar to what we've done there, uh, but one can show that after time t, if the initial state of the system, I again write it in terms of 
that basis by j c m and n uh, is like this, then the final state of the of this joint system would be sum over m n um, rho m n of t, where this is just the evolution given by the original Hamiltonian of the system um, by m by n tends a product the state on the clock, which we'll call phi, yeah, phi m, phi n, the big phi n and phi m, such that phi n on the clock is given by e to the power minus i, um, yes, i t p c plus omega n uh, v of x c on the original state. Um, yes, and by doing this, we basically, um, yeah, you can compare it to the to the to the initial to the answer that we get by just um, applying that unitary there. And you see that the we can actually use the clock as, in some sense, yeah, measure of of the time uh, passed on on the original system, and the original system, and Im implementing that Hamiltonian. Basically, yeah, the trick the trick here is just to accept uh, instead of uh, relying the potential on the time, we rely on the potential on the time of the clock, which is in this case the position. Okay, uh, so this was all on the peak lock, and now we will look at the case of uh, see, okay, uh, case of the quasi-ideal clock. So quasi-ideal clock. Uh, does not want, does not have continuous time states, so its Hamiltonian given is given as uh, the latter Hamiltonian. So an omega and e n. So we basically just have. Um, D levels um, with rising energy, so it's a bit of like if you take the harmonic oscillator and then cut it for D levels. And um, the omega determines the energy spacing um, and also the recurrence of the Hamiltonian by. So, of course, it, uh, the energy spacing is omega between each to um, neighboring levels. And the recurrence is the time um, in which the evolution will be, um, will bring the state back to where the state was, uh, regardless of where it started. So, for example, to define the recurrence time here, uh, we will need, we will label it as T0, and we write that the evolution after this time t0 um, should be the identity. So basically after uh, the state of the clock naturally evolves uh, for the time t0, it will come back to wherever it was before. And indeed we can write this as e to the power minus i sum over n, um, yeah, n omega t0 en en 
Uh, and then we can note that if we take T0, or actually, yeah, we can even massage this equation. Uh, so we'll ha we have the exponential of the um, basically diagonal matrix. So what we will get is also a diagonal matrix, uh, but with exponentiated diagonal elements. So we will get e to the power minus i and omega t0 en en. And if we choose omega being 2 pi over, sorry, if we choose t0 being uh, 2 pi over omega, then this will be just the identity because all elements, diagonal elements will be one. Okay, uh, so we have some time of recurrence. So in a sense, you can think about it. Oh, if we, if we look at the usual um, circle or clock at some point, uh, it comes back to where it was initially. So it has some period. Um, so, and then we define a set of time states. So basis of time states, which can also be principle seen as the states on this usual circular clock and then, then can rotate into each other uh, while undergoing the evolution. So the states theta k, they are defined as the Fourier transform, as you already seen in the lecture of the initial basis. So square root of d, sum e to the power minus i, 2 pi, nk over d, en. Okay, because of 2 pi here, um, in principle, the states can be defined for any k between, yeah, 0 infinity, but uh, because of the 2 pi, we have kind of this period of d. So theta k is always theta k uh, modulus d. Uh, okay, and then this picture uh, describes the can describe the connection between these basis states. So after after some time, which is given by t0 over d, um, the state theta k will rotate into the state theta k plus 1. So, and this is the same as thinking about evolution as um, this evolution going the full circle here. So every increment of time t, which is t0 over d, um, this passage happens. So this is easy to see uh, by just applying this evolution to the state theta k minus i c t0 over d uh, acting on theta k. So uh, basically what I will need to do, I will need to act with this operator on this state, and this state is um, uh, one of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which means that, that that action will only give me a phase factor. So, in fact, then I can write this as the following, pnk over d plus uh, the phase factor, which will be given by i uh, n omega t0 
t0 over d and because t0 is 2 pi over omega this will give me 2 pn over d so this will be just 2 pn over d k plus 1 pn and this is exactly uh, theta k plus 1 okay uh good now what we'll be briefly looking at are different limits of this uh, of this clock so the first limit is when we have let me call this delta t so it's a bit different from the usual t so the first limit is when the dimension goes to infinity and delta t which is 2 pi over d omega it's this delta t uh, goes to zero so uh, what will happen to the time states in this limit Yes, exactly. So this can be seen from, just easily seen from the fact that um, delta t goes to zero, which means that, uh, yeah, which means that the difference between two neighboring time states will become very small, smaller and smaller, and eventually zero. Uh, and then the dimension also goes to infinity, which means that they're going to be an infinite number of um, uh, these time states. So in that sense, the time states will become continuous. Okay. And the second limit uh, is a bit different. So we're going to again take the dimension to infinity we're going to take the omega to zero, but we'll require that omega d will be constant. Uh, so what happens in this case? So in this case, in fact, um, the time states will not be continuous because they're always going to be... Um, non-zero uh, delta t difference between two time states. Uh, so basically from this, it follows that delta t is bigger than zero. Um, on the other hand, the energy spectrum will become uh, continuous, which uh, in fact didn't happen there. So here we still have discrete energies. like oscillating energies it's better to say and here we have discrete time states and continuous energy okay um, yes, this was all for the quasi-ideal clock. I think now it's a, yes. Ah, because basically, um, we take the dimension to infinity and we take, uh, and by virtue of that, in fact, um, the delta T will go to zero. So the difference between time states will be incomprehensible. However, that does not require us to actually put omega to zero. So in that sense, uh, the Hamiltonian with the, with the energies would still be discrete. So there's going to be still distinct uh, 
an infinite number, yes, with distinct distinct energy levels. So it's going to oscillate between them, effectively. Okay, uh, now is a good time to, do, to make a break. Uh, and after the break, we'll talk about the thermal limits of the clocks. So see you in, yeah, in 10 minutes, say. So 10 to 1. Shall we continue? So now, now forget about all these clocks we considered before. Now we're going to consider clocks in a, in a bit of a different manner. We're going to consider them as things which output ticks. Um, so whether it's regular or not, uh, or precise or not, this we'll uh, see. Uh, and basically then, I think Rolf will talk about it a bit, uh, a bit more tomorrow, but then the idea is that um, each tick is uh, characterized by so each clock is characterized by the output distribution of a tick. So basically, this is the probability of getting the tick over some external time t. So it can be something like this, or I don't know, something like this, more concentrated. But this is essentially a probability distribution of um, getting a tick after time t. And the one important uh, kind of me uh, measure of this distribution would be something that we call precision. So precision r is defined as mu squared over sigma squared, right, just with the squares, you see? Indeed, with the squares. Um, and the bigger the value of r is, the better the clock is. Uh, so this is justified by the fact that our first um, sigma squared, which is the variance of the probability distribution, we want it to be as small as possible. So the tick has to be concentrated around some time, or t0. And the mu squared, which is the mean, or the square of the mean value of the probability distribution, uh, has also to be, uh, it's good if it's bigger because then the tick is clearly separated, can be clearly separated from all other uh, further ticks. And one can think about different probability distributions. So one of the probability distributions is, for example, the Poisson distribution and so on. Um, and one can evaluate this R. Okay, so uh, Ralph will talk hope more about this. Um, as for now, we just we just take uh, that this precision is a good good measure of how the good clock is. Yes. Ah, this is just the probability distribution, so it's p of t. Yeah. Okay, so we take this r, and then we make up a thermal clock, and we see how. Um, by which, uh, by which, um, I don't know, by which observables the the value of R is uh, constrained for the thermal clock, and the thermal clock that we're looking at is the following. So first, the clock itself is going to be a d minus one dimensional system. It states from I don't know one to d. Um, it's going to be a ladder system, uh, and the difference between two neighboring energy levels will be, will be E W. And then the machine which will drive the the ticks will be the thermal machine, which will consist of two qubits, hot one with the energy gap EH connected to the hot bath at a temperature TH and a cold qubit with the energy gap EC connected to the cold bath with a temperature TC. Okay, 
and EC will assume is less than EH. And this is our thermal machine. Uh, and this thermal machine will drive the transitions in our clock. So initially, our clock start, starts in a ground state. Then the machine each time drives the, with, with some probability will, uh, will result in the, in the clock uh, jumping to the next state. And when the, when the state of the clock reaches the, the final state, so the state with the most energy, um, the decay will happen. So basically, then the state will uh, degrade back to the lowest energy state. And at the same time, the photon will be released. And the photon will go into the detector, and the detector will click. So in this in this case, the the clicks of the the ticks of the clock will be triggered by this probabilistic random walk up the up this energy ladder. And now we want to know what is the precision of this clock. Okay, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna make a bunch of assumptions um, as usual. So basically, we will we'll assume that the action of the machine which drives the transitions can be seen as um, a resonant exchange between, uh, between our clock and our um, yeah, the virtual qubit, which is uh, which is formed by the hot and the cold qubit of the machine. So it's going to be exchange with virtual qubit. Of yeah, let's call the system somehow. Yeah, this is uh, agency. So the virtual temperature of this qubit, if you remember from our thermal part of the course, course will be given by the following. So we assume this because, uh, because the um, yeah, we, we, we assume that the coupling between these two systems is weak enough that we can assume um, that this interaction can be just boiled down to the exchange, to this exchange. Okay. Uh, and again, this, uh, this clock, it emits a photon when, when the energy is on the higher level on the highest level. So the energy in this case will be, we'll call it E double E gamma, uh, which also corresponds to the energy of the emitted photon, uh, D minus one E double U. Uh, okay. Of course, uh, another assumption is that uh, actually, because we assume that all processes are unitary, uh, and this decay is also part of a unitary process. There is also a probability for the reverse process, but uh, because we assume, so for example, there is a probability that given that the system is in the uh, ground state, it can go to the most excited state directly, but we uh, neglect that probability by just saying that this, um, this energy of the photon is, um, is much higher than the characteristic energies of the setting. So characteristic temperatures, for example. 
Okay, so reversive process, we don't uh, take into account. And then everything that we have to do is to analyze um, the, the evolution of the state of the clock, which is essentially a random walk. So it's um, a stochastic process. So at every step, so I'm just saying that we're employing random walk. At each step, um, one can think that, uh, let's see, these are three neighboring um, energy levels of the ladder, and uh, the state of the system is here. So there is some probability to go on a lower state of the ladder and some probability to go on the um, level above. And the ratio between these two probabilities to go up and to go down is given by the virtual temperature. Because the process um, describing the action of the machine is the exchange with the virtual qubit. Okay, uh, so essentially we have uh, a random walk. So we have the grid of integers which correspond to the population um, populations of each of the states of the ladder. Uh, and we label these populations as Q of nt. So n is the uh, number of the, of the ladder step, and t is the time. And sum over n, Q of nt equals one because all populations have to sum up to one. And then for, for each uh, element, there is a probability to go in a lower state or in a higher state, the neighboring ones. And then I can write just the usual um, differential equation that, I, that we write when we are talking about random walks like this. So I write what is the change in this population with time. So uh, here, either something came from below, so from Q n minus one T, plus something came from above, P down Q of n plus one T, uh, minus uh, P up plus P down Q of NT. So, and some, some of them have, and some, some of the population here has left to be up or down. So this is just the usual thing that we write. Okay. Uh, then for this, Populations, we can define the mean mu uh, because this population is essentially just a discrete probability distribution. Yes. Yes, this is this is a probability. Uh, Yes, so yes, so in a sense, one can think about each time step as one exchange with the machine. Yes, does it make sense? Yeah, so therefore it's like a rate. Yeah, I guess you can say it's a rate, yes. Okay, um, so we can define the mean for this distribution, which is sum over n n of qt, sorry, q of nt. And we can define a variance, which is just sum over n, um, n minus 
mu of t squared q of nt. Okay, so now what we want to calculate is the rate of change, um, yeah, the rate of change of the mean. So d mu by dt. And then we'll calculate the rate of change of oh, the variance. So now I just want to see how the average, um, where on average is the state of the system after time t. So d mu dt equals sum over n and dq nt dt. This we have. Um, so let's try to substitute. And Q up Q and minus one T plus P down Q and plus one T uh, minus Q up plus p down q and t okay um yes what is this equal to yes okay so we'll have to shift some things so first sum over n, n by p up q of n minus 1 t plus, uh, so I shift n by 1, uh, so let me say that this is n from 1 to d minus 1. I get so yeah and by up uh plus sum over n zero Yeah, sum from n equal one. This is gonna be from two to d. Um, yeah, okay, let me not care about the limits for now. I'm anyway looking at it for a big dimension, so terms shouldn't matter so much. So I'm just gonna shift one by one plus one and the other one by minus one. So it will be sum over n, n plus one, p up q and t plus sum over n, um, n minus one, down q of nt minus sum over n n p up plus p down q of nt okay some terms will go away and this will be 
um, pi up, sorry, p up, uh, minus p down, sum over n, q of n t, and this will give us one. So we'll have p up minus p down. Okay. Uh, analogous consideration works for the um, rate of change of the variance with time. So you can substitute it. Some also shift the ends and some terms will go away and you'll get P up plus P down. Uh, yes. Now, why, why did we look at the rate of change of the mean? Well, it will tell us um, how, how long on average this clock takes to tick. So, because we know that in the end, uh, the, the, chain, the net change of the mean should be of the order d, because uh, the d minus one, approximately d steps have to be made. then the time on average the clock will take to tick would be d over the rate of change of the mean. Okay, so... so. Um, so basically then, let me see how I label it, yeah, uh, so the time needed for a tick on average would be D, which is the length of the ladder, over the ch how the mean changes. Okay, so this will be D over the up minus p down. Uh, then one can also calculate that in the time taken by the clock to produce uh, one tick, the var we can also calculate the um, how the variance has changed. So delta sigma square would be uh, T tick uh, d sigma squared dt d up plus p down over p up minus p down. Uh, You can also calculate the delta t of the tick. If you're interested, that's just an additional exercise. It's sigma, you need to take sigma at the time of the tick and divide it by the rate of change. Uh, but fine. Uh, we don't we don't care about this much. So hence here we have our um, sigma for one tick. So delta sigma squared for one tick. And from this we can find the precision. And the precision will be, as we said, it's mu squared over sigma squared. In this case, um, yes, mu will be just one because it's one tick has been produced and uh, and then the sigma squared which will which is the accumulated variance for the time of the tick is written there. So basically what we get is the following. Uh, 
Ah, oh, sorry. Yes, I'm making a mistake. Uh, yes, indeed. I'm sorry for flaw in my logic. I was wondering how it was of 1 over d. Cannot be. Um, so, before we say this, so this is indeed for one tick, but mu is not the number of ticks, right? Mu is the um, kind of the average, um, the mean of the output. And in this case, we take mu equaling d because uh, d is the number of ladder steps that the, um, the system has to undergo. All right. Ah, no, wait, it's, it's much simpler. Why am I thinking about this? Uh, so, yes, yes. No, we just take mu as the time of the tick and be done with it. Mu would take the time of the tick, when the tick, the average time when the tick appears, and delta sigma we take as this thing. And then we calculate the precision. Oh, uh, sigma squared is the variance. So uh, in this sense, this is the variance of the distribution at the moment where the tick is produced here. Yeah. So you can think about, so we were thinking about this random walk, right? And this is the random walk over uh, where the probability distribution is the populations of, on the clock, populations of the energy levels of the clock. And for that probability distribution, we can uh, calculate the variance, which is the sigma squared. And then we want to know what's the variance in the, um, after the time, the average time at which the tick is produced which is the time of tick. And, uh, and by calculating that variance, we, um, we find the variance at the moment of producing the tick of the distribution. Does it make sense? Okay. Um, so basically, the, the time of the tick that we have calculated, this is the average time the system needs to, uh, to produce the tick. But then, of course, because, because this is a probabilistic uh, a process, uh, there will be some, some variance around that time. And delta sigma squared is exactly that. Okay, so then what we get is d squared over up minus down squared over d up plus down over up minus down. And what we get is d uh, p up minus down over P up plus P down. Okay, and here we see, as for many other systems, uh, that the precision uh, increases with the uh, dimension of the clock that we are using. Okay, uh, and back to the thermal nature of our uh, of our clock, which was the initial consideration. We know that uh, the ratio between these two rates is e to the power minus beta v e w. And that in fact one can show by plugging them in here that uh, R can be written as the following. D hyperbolic tangents D 
beta C minus beta H R Q C, which is the the amount the amount of heat that the cold bath has gotten, and it's beta H E gamma over two D. And when d goes to infinity, uh, in fact, one can one can show that this expression here is the change in entropy of the required for one tick. And if d goes to infinity, then the precision would uh, would tend to um, delta s tick over two. So when D goes to infinity, you can um, yeah, write the approximation of 10 and D will go away, basically. So in that, in that sense, uh, the precision of this thermal clock, which is driven by this machine, thermal machine, uh, is given basically by the entropy of single tick. Okay, uh, yes, so the last exercise was touching more upon this informational uh, aspect, so the theory of clocks and time uh, with this precision and everything. Uh, I'm not sure how much it will be covered in the lecture because in the end clocks were only for one week and um, there was not clearly not enough time. Uh, yes, but it's important to also think about clocks as mach as some devices producing ticks and then analyze the quality of that ticks is uh, is a complete separate research question okay uh i think this is all for today and all for this semester thank you for sticking with me for so long if you have any questions feel free to ask me write me or whichever way you find it. And I hope to see many of you at the summer school.